Captain's Report, February 4th, 2021. Five years. Five long years. No! No! No, 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 no! This isn't happening. I'm going to have to make an emergency landing. Hold on! Why you look down. and it looks so bad? Oh, people are going to be mad. Did you feel underwhelmed by the no. ground? No. No. I can't stand this. At first it was going well. We've got a lot to talk about today with Halo Infinite. And setback after setback. Halo Infinite has been delayed from its originally planned holiday release. Loss after loss. This is the second Halo Infinite director to depart in two years. Made what was going to be a quick and decisive win into five years of hell. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your support. And as we close, I'd like to share a first look at a project that I'm very excited about and the dawn of a new trilogy for Xbox 360. I think the fundamental difference between the Bungie and 343 is, is the, the way that they were formed. And they're very, very different. Bungie formed very naturally, very organically as a small studio building really small experiences and grew into those big shoes and grew into Halo and then and the, the, the trilogy that they built. Obviously the difference between that and how 343 was formed, 343 was brought in to work on an existing franchise an existing universe with an existing fan base on existing hardware. And of course you have different visions and people have different opinions about what direction it should go in. And that's the thing that creates the, the creative tension and, the, uh, and the, uh, the drive to make it uh, better than it's ever been. The challenge that the studio was taking on was really incredibly ambitious, um, and some might even say crazy, and that was really attractive to me, um, the, the idea of trying to create a studio from scratch and bring all of these people together from across the industry to ship the next great title in one of the greatest series of games that has ever been made. There's nothing more ambitious than that. Wake up, Chief. I need you. With Bungie taking a permanent leave of absence to pursue new frontiers, Microsoft took a DIY approach and formed 343 Industries. Can a rookie developer uphold the lofty standards of one of the industry's most revered franchises? But there's another question you have to ask yourself. What if Halo 4 is the best Halo ever? Let's just get this out of the way right now. I don't like Halo 4. An overdramatic forced love story with a confusing plot and lackluster main it villain. It is just so bad. Did they break it? Did they ruin it? I feel it? Like the biggest issue with the campaign is the gameplay itself. After all, 343 has never shipped anything before. 4's core gameplay just didn't work well enough. There's so many little issues that stack on each other to create a rather frustrating experience. I shall endeavor to point out why Halo 4's story is simply unacceptable. Generally, you only give away the lore of your fiction at the end of a story if you give it away at all. 343 Industries landed on the opposite side of the long-standing fiction guidelines by revealing everything you didn't even need to know in the first entry of a brand new Halo storyline. This entire three-minute cutscene is a huge waste of time because literally none of this is important to the story of Halo 4 and never comes up again. This scene of Spartans dropping in to fight the Covenant doesn't make any sense because they're not in the right armor and the Covenant aren't either. Now there is an explanation for this art style change, but it's not in the game. In an interview with Frank O'Connor, he says the reason why Chiefs armor changes from Halo 3 to 4 is because of nanobots that upgraded it while he was in cryosleep. Some, uh, some fans were upset of the idea of nanobots making repairs to uh, the, the Chief's armor, which is if we're in the 26th century and nanotechnology hasn't advanced beyond where it is today, then we're probably in a lot of trouble. But aren't the cruisers supposed to be much bigger? These are baby cruisers. Uh, nanomachines. Oh, That's the explanation for everything. Nanomachines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of Halo 3, the elites were, well, I wouldn't say properly allied with the UNSC, but, you know, they were on the same side. Does the game actually explain why the Covenant are back and why the elites are our enemies again? 
Yeah, I'll give you a little, a little sneak preview about this particular faction, and, uh, and they are a particularly virulent form of the former covenant with some really, uh, uh, really enthusiastic, shall we say, religious beliefs about the forerunners. Sorry if I seem like a complete noob, but can someone please explain to me why the UNSC is fighting elites in Halo 4 after becoming allies in Halo 3? Good question. It isn't explained in Halo 4. The Covenant return in the form of the Storm Covenant, which is run by the elites. Now a faction of them want to continue their genocide against humans despite having zero reason to. This is some incredibly poorly explained reasoning for why Master Chief has to fight elites again. What are the Covenant even doing? Rather than simply glassing the Dawn from the safety of their own ships, they send tons of their own troops aboard. The Covenant boarding the Dawn is completely senseless and stupid. Prometheans are made up of the Knights, the Watchers, and the Crawlers. One of the big focuses for us in the design of the Forerunners was to have these different enemy classes that would be able to work together. What on earth went so terribly wrong with knights in the development process that we have some of the most bullshit, bullet spongy enemies that we've ever seen in a Halo game? I think the knight's been through almost like 15 plus iterations. Okay, let's clear some things up right off the bat here. When your shield goes down, you have to not take any damage for a certain amount of time before it will start to recharge. For the player, that time is 5 seconds in Halo 2 and 3. And Enemy shields, however, have a different recharge delay and time than the player. In the case of Halo Combat Evolved, this recharge delay, noted as stun time here, is actually an entire 12 seconds. Now look at Halo 2. The blue miners have a stun time of 15 seconds. For Halo 3, the brute's power armor doesn't recharge at all once it's depleted, so we can skip right to Halo 4, where we can see that the recharge delay on Elite's shields is 3 seconds regardless of difficulty. Knight's shields have the exact same values of a 3 second delay regardless of difficulty. This short amount of time that it takes for a knight to completely regain its shield wouldn't be too bad if it wasn't combined with their ability to teleport. There are a variety of knight classes and each one of them is progressively more powerful, but your base knight actually starts just a little bit more powerful than an elite. But in addition to that, we wanted the knight to have his own set of traits and abilities. Knights can phase in out of anywhere. He's able to go where he needs to at any time, which is something the Covenant can't do. Knights will literally disappear into thin air when their shield starts to get too depleted and will reappear somewhere else, usually behind cover where you can't shoot them. The general tactic that you usually end up resorting to when facing knights is to spam shots from the light rifle from a distance until they finally disintegrate. There's no thinking, no challenge, and no fun. So I think one of the areas with Halo 4 that we're really trying to um, push beyond where Halo's been in the past is we're, we have a much um, clearer focus in, in terms of storytelling um, and character development. Conan O'Brien here with another edition of Clueless Gamer. Today we are tackling one of the biggies, Halo 4. Halo 4, what do I need to know to play this game? It's the beginning of a second trilogy uh, in the Halo universe. Basically there's this uh, alien race called the Covenant who is at war with humanity, no, who is actually having its forerunners who uh, perish, and the Covenant, they're theocratic the race, uh, this thing called the Covenant, humanity, and, but then hum it screwed up humanity, so then all, there's these AI warriors. For me, problems occur with the Cortana and Chief narrative. Because this game only has eight playable missions, they have to force this emotional conflict into areas where it feels so out of place. I can give you over 40,000 reasons why I know that sun isn't real. I know it because the emitter's Rayleigh effect is disproportionate to its suggested size. I know it because its stellar cycle is more symmetrical than that of an actual star. But for all that, I'll never actually know if it looks real, if it feels real. Wow, what an action-packed tale. This is the scene where the narrative takes a nosedive and becomes a Jason Blundell-esque exposition dump. The game stops dead in its tracks for five minutes just to explain a bunch of nonsense. So the librarian appears before Chief and talks to him about many important plot points. Let's list them all, shall we? 
and try not to get lost. Number one, the librarian is some sort of ghost or AI that was kept alive to assist humanity on their path to the mantle. Number two, humanity's path to the mantle is at risk. Number three, Didact is trying to leave Requiem and we can't allow it. Number four, he seeks to compose a device which will allow him to contain the greatest threat the Forerunners ever faced, humanity. Number five, a history of mankind's previous journey into the stars, their encounter with the Forerunners, how humanity was unmatched until the Didact and his warriors stepped in. Number six, the Didact battled the humans for a millennia and afterwards was sentenced to severe punishment. Number seven, humanity's threat was not just the Forerunners, but also the Flood. During this time, they were retreating from the Flood. Number eight, the Forerunners weakened from the conflicts that succumbed to the parasite. Number nine, Forerunners make plans for a final unspecified great journey. Number ten, Didact didn't want to yield the mantle and insisted on fighting the Flood. Number eleven, Didact wanted to fight the Flood at the cost of using the composer to transform living beings into warriors. This creates the Prometheans being part of their quest for transcendence and immortality. Number twelve, composer doesn't work as intended, creating abominations. Number thirteen, Didact would use the composer to enact his revenge against the Flood. Number fourteen, Prometheans are actually humans. Number fifteen, Didact wanted to turn all humans into Prometheans, but the librarian intervened, portraying the Didact and removing the composer from his core and sealing him in the cryptum. Number sixteen, librarian and indexed humanity for repopulation, planting their seeds in places the Didact was unaware of. The purpose behind this was to accelerate mankind's evolution in the Chief's current state, the Spartans, and the AI Cortana. This was planned over a thousand lifetimes. Number 17, the Librarian is actually dead, and this is some sort of dream sequence. Number 18, the Librarian places Gene Song within the Master Chief that contains an immunity to the Composer, but this could only be unlocked through magic powers. The Librarian has allowing her to accelerate the Chief's evolution, granting him the immunity. Oh, Jesus. Chief, what happened? Your bio readings are all over the map. It's a long story. With new enemy class comes new weapon class. We literally concepted probably 200 weapons for this game before we settled on the half a dozen that went in. It's kind of like you've got that balance between humans' model of what a weapon's like and the desire to want to try and make something crazy and futuristic. While they have interesting designs, the Promethean weapons just aren't fun to use. These weapons aren't special and don't really bring anything unique to the table. Your worst enemy is the weapons and ammo themselves. It is awe-inspiring how pitiful the ammo capacity is for the guns in this game. Starting with the Halo Comedy Evolved Plasma Pistol, we can see that the weapon consumes 1% of its battery for every 5 shots. Halo 4, however, decided to nerf the hell out of the Plasma Pistol by making it consume 10 times as much ammo than ever before. On the surface, it appears that the player has a plethora of options because 343 added so many weapons, but due to poor design, many weapons are essentially useless or run out of ammo so quickly that they can only be used occasionally. In well over half the game, you will exclusively fight Prometheans, who only drop Promethean weapons. Of these weapons, the suppressor and bolt shot are too weak to do anything meaningful on heroic or higher. This leaves a player with just the light rifle as a valuable weapon for most encounters. However, this turns over half the game into a boring gallery type shooter. There is, of course, the scatter shot, but the scatter shot is often too risky due to the knight's ability to teleport at will and instantly kill you with a single melee attack. They're not gonna make this easy, are they? We're gonna announce more about multiplayer and forge later in the year, but right now we're showing war games, which is the kind of uh, our newly fictionalized traditional competitive multiplayer. So if you want to play Team Slayer, capture the flag, you're going to do it under the auspices of war games. Is there ranked um, multiplayer matchmaking uh, in terms of like Halo 2 and Halo 3 where it's 1 to 50? Um, so is the networking going to be peer-to-peer -peer or are you going to have dedicated servers? Uh, that's two questions. Halo 4. From November to January, the average daily peak population is down 62%. So, what's wrong? Why have people stopped playing? Let's start with lack of a skill-based ranking system. It's the online multiplayer where you will find the most game-changing and controversial changes to the Halo experience. You're getting points now for kills, assists, distractions. Once your ordnance meter fills up. Ordnance break. Bam, bam, bam. Three rewards you can choose from. I don't like the idea of custom loadouts, and I don't think that needing to unlock your guns makes the game any better. Plasma grenades. Oh my god, these should not be starting weapons. Look at everything I posted and name one thing that's wrong in it. We have to, like, yeah, 343 four, three gave us a shitty game, like, but they, they're putting in a ranking system. They're putting in a competitive like, player. They're going to do that. They're going to do that. We don't have any of them. This game is complete fucking trash right now. Just like in single player, the graphics and detail in all 10 multiplayer maps that shipped with the game are incredible, and that's where 343 Industries deserves a round of applause. It's hard to believe Halo 4 looks as good as it does for being on the Xbox 360, which came out in 2005. Despite all of this, there are problems. Halo 4 shipped with 10 maps, 
five of those being big team maps suitable for no less than 16 players. The thing is, there is only one true big team playlist, which is big team Infinity Slayer. How can they reason making half the maps out of the box just for one playlist? The simple answer to this question, I'll let kind of elaborate, is that we actually haven't finished the, the matchmaking playlists for the game. Okay. We're working on that now, obviously, as we, as we sort of tune and finalize the rest of the systems. There are a lot of people right now that are a lot into a different kind of multiplayer game. Games like Call of Duty and Battlefield. How hard is it going to be to harness Call of Duty that has right now like four, four spots in the top 10 on Xbox Live? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's true, you know, we, uh, we I think we only just crept up above uh, Modern Warfare 2. We, we compete with them, of course, but we're not trying to copy them or trying to chase their tail. What we're trying to do is make the best possible game we can. And uh, that's what you have to go after. I think if you try and copy what other people are doing and you do it badly, then it's worse than if you'd never tried at all. 343 decided to go the way of Call of Duty by introducing classes where you can choose everything from your primary weapon, to your grenade type, to your armor ability, and so on. While 343 constantly felt the need to reiterate that they had no intention of copying Call of Duty, let's take a look at some of the quote-unquote new features. In previous Halo games, everybody spawned with the same weapons and or abilities and fought for map control. But in Halo 4, players could choose weapons and perks that fit their playstyle and never had to venture out of their comfort zone. Like perks, tactical packages passively affected gameplay. One tactical package, Firepower, allowed players to carry two primary weapons. There is an identical perk in Call of Duty called Overkill. Ordnance drops were Halo's version of killstreaks. The fish stick button layout was introduced in Halo 4. This button layout is pretty much the exact same as the default button layout in COD. Kill cams or instant replay and join in progress were also introduced in Halo 4. I shouldn't have to say this, but these features have been staples in COD for years. Welcome aboard the UNSC Infinity. I'm Spartan Sarah Palmer, Infinity Commander. Spartans have earned a high degree of autonomy over the weapons, abilities, and armor they take into combat. Access loadouts to customize the gear you take into battle. Rank up on the battlefield and you'll earn all the shiny new toys. There are issues with some of the weapons available for loadouts. Starting with primary weapons, there's one clear winner, that being the DMR. In my opinion, the DMR should be considered a power weapon due to how accurate and quick you can kill your enemies at almost any range. It has turned Halo into a long range shooter rather than that classic Halo experience full of both up close and long range encounters. The only secondary weapon I have an issue with is the bolt shot. The bolt shot is used like a shotgun, and when you start with a shotgun in your pocket, you're immediately more powerful than every opponent without one. The charge bolt shot is a one shot kill from a pretty generous distance. As you can see here, the bolt shot can kill you up to this red line. What is surprising is that the UNSC shotgun has a shorter one-shot kill distance. The fact that this weapon is available for loadouts is ridiculous. Spartan Palmer didn't see it as a problem. How about you? Halo, obviously, uh, really all about the multiplayer. Dive in for more of the core. What are they going to be looking forward to with regards to multiplayer? The other thing that we showed in, in the briefing was a new ability uh, called Promethean Vision. And this is an ability that allows players to see through solid objects. Promethean Vision removes the need for players to properly utilize their radars. The radar already shows you where the player is and on what level they're on, if they're higher or lower. So why do we need an ability that lets players see through walls? It reduces their awareness and cheapens the gameplay for others. Once your ordnance meter fills up, the UNSC Infinity gives you three rewards you can choose from. Those are going to be power weapons, power ups, or grenades, and you can call them down right to you. You know, we're working really hard to balance these things out, beat these elements out. We're making sure there's not dominant strategies. Ordinance is random. I hate the idea uh, that ordinance is random because it just adds randomness to the game. There's a chance that the enemy team are all going to get better weapons than you and they're going to win because of the luck of those weapons. World Ordinance, which is present in almost every playlist, is completely random. Every two minutes on the game clock, a random weapon will drop at a random place on the map. This eliminates strategy and belongs in a social setting where the game isn't taken as seriously. The maps feel barren, empty, because there's hardly ever a reason to go looking for weapons or power-ups or anything. Also because of loadouts, not even basic weapons are on the map, and because of this, map control power positions are nearly non-existent. So it turned Halo 4 into a cheap Call of Duty game, where 99% of the time you're just looking for someone to shoot. If you try and copy what other people are doing and you do it badly, then, then it's, it's worse than, than if you've never, never tried it at all. all. 
Forge is our tool set that allows players to customize their own levels. So we give multiple spaces that each have unique components that you can kind of mix and match to make your own layouts. Almost all of the objects and structures you can place are simply reskinned versions of objects from Halo Reach, so map creators will be using the same pieces that they have been building with for years. There is also a lack of any large flat areas that would grant you a blank canvas to design a map exactly how you like. We definitely looked at what we did in Halo Reach and said, what can we remove from this? It's one thing to lose just a stunning amount of map spaces, but like, nobody was expecting useful editing tools, I don't think. Like, that was just a completely, whoa, <laughs> what? In Halo Reach, it was kind of cool that you could move things around, but it was still too easy for users. And we're like, we have to make this worse. You're now spending like three hours trying to get one block to line up with three other blocks. You can do custom colors. You can take these forge pieces and say, hey, that's blue base. So the blue base can truly look like the blue base. Halo 4 is a minimized sandbox for moves things like, you know, falcons. And if people want to build some sort of freaky map and really, really make use of the falcon, they can't do that now. Suicide. We're incrementally evolving different aspects of the game design, but there's nothing really revolutionary. And I think that's important, because I think really good design is evolutionary, not revolutionary. And I think at some points we got in our heads with this game that we're just going to make another Halo. I don't think that's what people want. They may think they want that, but what they really want is something that speaks to the things that they love, but then provides them with something new. Is that the official version these days? <laughs> You ought to see what came next. Ladies and gentlemen, from 343 Industries, Bonnie Ross. At 343, when we think about the Halo universe, we think of it as a real place inhabited by real characters and populated with a real, almost tangible history. And so bringing that history to life on Xbox One isn't just about making a game. It's about embracing our traditions and our roots and everything that we are passionate about with Halo. It's about retelling Chief's entire legendary tale, precisely the way you remembered it. And so, on November 11, 2014, you can play the entire Master Chief saga on a single console with Halo, the Master Chief Collection. The matchmaking servers are completely messed up. Uh, this is one of the worst launches in video game history. I mean, it's ridiculous. This is like, how the fuck can you release this? You can't release this. The MCC has only been out for four months, and of those four months, there's not been a single day when the game was fully functional. Any time something new is released, it breaks something else in the game. You should have just waited, or just released all these games separately, like you've said in press statements beforehand. Exactly as it shipped ten years ago. What? Oh, why am I? Once a game drops and it comes out, you expect that the game that you buy works. One of the biggest failures I've ever seen in gaming history. And it hit the shot. Bam! Sniped the wall. Sniped them right fucking through it. Awesome. Great game. Great game we got here. But ultimately, populations are so low that in most playlists, most of the time, it's not going to be able to consistently match eight players of the same rank or 16 in big team battle. You know, Halo 2 worked in 2004. How can this not work in 2005? But it is overall just a fairly piss poor uh, job at releasing a game. And I can't believe I'm saying that. It's super depressing that I am. And I just, I, can, I cannot fathom the incompetence of the devs. Precisely the way you remembered it.
My name's Dan Abe. I'm executive producer at 343 on the Master Chief Collection. So it was interesting, coming out of E3, one of the first questions we started getting was around the ranking system. So we're really excited to be able to talk about it today. So we are using the ranking system from Halo 2. It is going to be that skill-based ranking system where as you win matches, your level goes up, but as you lose matches, your level actually goes down. In addition to having that system, we're doing some things behind the hood, under the hood for things like that. It's actually just gonna end up with, uh, really across any Halo to date, just the fastest, fairest matchmaking system you've ever seen. It's been 20 minutes. 20 minutes of searching. Nothing. Not a single match. You gotta be fucking kidding me. It's loading. We're going. And like half their team is gonna get pushed out of the game halfway through <laughs> this loading screen. If you look at the loading bar, it's not moving at all. <laughs> oh, look, it wasn't successful. Is this what I paid sixty dollars for? <laughs> Dude, all of, look at everyone in the, in our game is fucking in my party now. What? Everyone that was in our Halo Two lobby and you guys are all in my fucking lobby now together, and we're all searching for a big team battle. No, we're in Halo Two Classic. In right classic. Now. I'm in There's big no team. Words. I don't think this game works, dude. It's Corp Man, and today on the Halo Master Chief Collection, if you are connection host, then you can boot anyone in the game. So once the game starts, you can kind of figure out if you can do this simply by selecting someone's name and then clicking on it. If it doesn't just say mute, if it says boot from the party, right, like it does right here, then... Well, obviously you can boot him. I mean, it, I actually just booted him. It does actually work. The fact that it's probably the connection host that gets this capability means that someone will always have this capability. And if this becomes well known, then someone's always oh, just gonna get this. Oh shit! God damn it, dude. All right, dude, we win. Fuck this broken ass game. This is so stupid. This is so stupid. We just won. Good game, guys. Boot the other team. Rank. Rank match Rank. 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 Master Chief Collection has over 100 multiplayer maps. That is every map ever released on Halo 1 through 4, all running at 1080p, 60 frames per second, on dedicated servers. So, here's the thing, right? People have been wondering how it is possible for someone to be the host of a game when 343 Industries and Microsoft are claiming these games to be played on dedicated servers. But Frank O'Connor actually commented on this on NeoGAF.com, and I think he makes a pretty good case. He says that match-made games are mostly played on dedicated servers, and things such as a host being able to kick other players or being able to see who is host in general is just a UI bug. He also says, though, that in certain circumstances, the game will fall back to a peer-to-peer -peer connection system. And this is where it gets problematic. The MCC simply does not have any of the functionality that would be required to make a peer-to-peer -peer connection system work properly. An example of that would be host migration. So the next thing I want to talk about and prove is that host migration is not a feature. So host migration is pretty self-explanatory, but if you're unaware, host migration is the migration or changing of a host during the game. But anyway, the reason that we need host migration, aside from like the bad connection aspect, because obviously if a player pulls host and they don't have a very good connection, then you have to play that entire game on their host, is the fact that when a player pulls host in matchmaking, they can simply end the game. If they quit the game like the normal way, like if you press start and you quit the fucking game, the game ends. And also, if you dashboard while you're host in a matchmade game, everyone goes black screen. Everyone's game crashes. Now, if your name isn't Frank O'Connor and you don't work for 343 Industries, then you could probably tell that this is a pretty big issue. Basically, what 343 did by not implementing host migration, they basically reverted back to Halo 2, where you can stand by. Because honestly, what's stopping you from pulling host in matchmaking and uploading a YouTube video or 
torrenting or lag switching. You could basically stand by, you could vote objective, and you could upload a fucking YouTube video and everyone lags. Another problem with the matchmaking is that there are many ways for people to cheat their way to rank 50. For instance, if you get into a game versus players who you think or know to be better than you, or if you get a map that you're not good at, you can just force quit the game through the Xbox dashboard and your rank will be unaffected. Not only that, but let's say you just played versus someone that beat you and you don't want to play versus them again. You can just block them and you'll never be matched with or against them in matchmaking ever again. At the surface level, this may not seem that big of a deal, but I think we can all see how this affects the integrity of the rank system, at least to a certain degree. The Xbox One block feature was meant to avoid cheaters and trolls, but players started blocking competition in effort to reach rank 50. This was a common tactic for lesser skilled players because they were able to reach max rank without having to play good players. But the bigger issue was that blocking a player negatively affected their reputation. The Xbox One had a reputation system. Players could have a red, yellow, or green rep. After a player gets blocked a certain amount of time, Times, the reputation starts to go down. Once a player was in red rep, they could not find matchmaking games in MCC. This went on for many months. So as you can see, I'm red reputation, avoid me. Now I've only actually been reported 15 times in the last six months, and I've played at least 5,000 unique players in the last six months. So that means easily less than 1% of the people I've played have reported me. Not only in my red rep, I actually received a two week ban for how low my reputation got. And if you're trying to ask Xbox support how to fix your red reputation, their response is you have to play multiplayer games without getting reported. But as you can see, <laughs> that's a bit flawed because you can't find the games at all in any game. I've been sitting here for 40 minutes. We got two people. Oh shit. Oh shit. Four people. Five people. Oh my god, dude. This is happening. Wait, what's the what's the teams? Oh, why do we have way more people than they do? This doesn't seem fair at all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the finals. A $50,000 prize pool is on the line as one of these teams will be taking home 20 thousand dollars now formal clearing the way yes Bro. trying to bring this bomb in. he oh, drops no. it down accidentally let's see he actually goes for the front ramp that might be a risky angle but right now might try to go for the arm and this is our first bomb arm of the day here now almost done just a few seconds left oh and yeah, it seems like something has happened it looks here. like yeah our referees uh, indicated that something happened in the back so we're getting word that uh, something happened with uh, one of the players we'll have to go ahead and check what uh, that was so we apologize right there as that match will need to be restarted but my goodness so i'm gonna let you in on some fun facts right here Halo the Master Chief Collection launched in November of last year, okay? It is now April of 2015, and to this day, if you try to play a match online, there is still connectivity issues. Connectivity issues to the point that 343 had to cancel Cup 1 in the second season of the official Halo Championship Series. The game has been out for a half a year, and 343 Industries has still not resolved the connectivity issues. 343 Industries studio head Bonnie Ross has taken to the Halo Waypoint forums to apologize to fans on behalf of the development team for the performance issues plaguing Halo the Master Chief Collection. We are deeply sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. Anyone who's played Halo the Master Chief Collection between launch and today will get, what's this? A month of Xbox Live Gold and an in-game nameplate and an exclusive in-game avatar. I'm just fucking with you. I mean, you will get those things, but you'll also get Halo 3 ODST completely free. From everyone at 343 Industries, we are truly sorry and feel your frustration. You deserve better and we are working day and night to find solutions as quickly as possible and we won't stop until it's worthy stop. of your passion stop. for our franchise. Stop. Stop. We won't 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 stop. Industries has released its big update for Halo the Master Chief Collection, designed to finally lay a majority of the title's matchmaking issues to rest. We're seeing progress. They're doing the best they can. We can't change anything. All we can do is hope that we get fast progress. There's some good news and a lot of bad news. 
to this update. 343 Industries has a huge list of fixes included in the update, which you can check out in the link below, but here's the short version. Halo 5 was nearing its release, and in October of 2015, all resources were pulled from MCC. I do not trust you. Noted. My friend's trust is not the issue today, Spartan Lock. It is my trust you must earn. Arbiter. You are a hunter, yes. A seeker of things. That's not the official job title, but... It's close enough. And now you hunt other Spartans. I'm not so much hunting a Spartan as I'm hunting the Spartan. One, one, seven. Master Chief, hero or traitor? Spartan Locke, friend or foe? Is this what you wanted? Is this what you were looking for? The one who was supposed to save us all. Was everything you've compromised Everything you've done, worth it. But now I must save us from you. You've completed your mission, Spartan Lock. This is the biggest and most ambitious Halo campaign yet. You'll control two distinct Spartan squads, one led by the Master Chief, the other by Spartan Locke. Agent Locke, uh, former Agent Locke, now Spartan Locke, has been tasked along with the other members of Team Osiris to hunt down the, tr the Chief. Right. And you've seen little hints of that in our uh, Hunt the Truth campaign. Yeah. Uh, the Chief is AWOL and he is the number one uh, task for them to solve. The official story is the Master Chief is dead. You, Spartan Locke, are the unofficial story. Your mission is go. Let's hunt him down. Hey everybody, I'm Ryan McCaffrey with IGN, joined by fellow Halo superfan Mitch Dyer. That's me. Mitch, Halo 5 is out. Yeah, so we're not gonna spoil anything that happens in Halo 5, but I do wanna talk about something that I think is really important, which is all of the marketing that we've seen for Halo 5, all the trailers, yeah. all the live action CG stuff. Which, like, it's been an awesome marketing yeah. campaign. Uh, Hunt the Truth, yes. the, the podcast, the, the cool, like, two-sided lock, yep. the initial reveal from E3 a couple years ago, all that stuff's been super cool. Yeah, but uh, none of it happens ever at all in Halo 5. All of that stuff that got me really excited for the story is inconsequential, non-existent, and not present at all, which I think is really disappointing. These scenes reflect a setting we never see, conflicts we never get to experience, character development that never happens, and badass dialogue that is non-existent in Halo 5. But I get, I get it. I get this premise. If the intention was some badass old Spartan versus new Spartan action. They would clash together, you know? That'd be pretty cool. If it actually happened in the fucking game! No, instead, there's a single cinematic where they punch each other a few times. Sir, you are absent without leave. This is your one chance to come home peacefully. Conference, Halo 5 Guardians, and joining us are creative director Josh Holmes and design director Kevin Franklin. Guys, uh, congratulations. The, uh, the campaign has been shown for the, uh, the first time ever, uh, and you picked a uh, Commander Lock level, right? We did, we did. Uh, yeah, I mean, we wanted to show off. Uh, Fans almost immediately noticed something was amiss when all the promotional material for the game didn't feature Master Chief, but Spartan Lock. Fans of the franchise were understandably a little concerned by this promotional material because it kind of suggests that Master Chief wasn't going to be in the game. Something 343 Industries tried to address by releasing a statement saying, no, Master Chief is absolutely still the main character of the Halo franchise and will be the main character of Halo 5. While Master Chief is in Halo 5 as promised, he is not the main character. In fact, he is only playable in three of the game's 15 missions. You play as Master Chief for three missions, and those missions where you're playing as Locke do nothing to the story. He's just trying to get to Master Chief. Missions will find you going from one world to the next with absolutely no context, and it doesn't further the story in any way whatsoever. 
First of all, we're reuniting Master Chief with Blue Team. They grew up together, you know, they, they trained together in the original Spartan program. Yeah. And up until this point, they've, they've mainly been uh, covered within the extended universe within the fiction and the novels. Yeah. So bringing them into the game and making them like a primary set of characters within our story in Halo 5 Guardians is, is a big deal. And it's something that we, we really worked hard to, to bring them to life in a, in a way that's true to the fiction. pretty reasonable for me to say without hardcore statistics that most Halo fans and there are millions of them have only ever played the games they know they know Halo through the games and the games have uh, the mainline Halo games have always led everyone to believe that Master Chief is the last Spartan he's yep. it he's the savior and then when Halo 5 starts there are three other Spartans <laughs> we have no idea who they are where they came from and they all seem to know each other no longer is it possible for players to simply put in a Halo game be able to play the campaign and enjoy it just on on its own. That's not possible. You've got to do your fucking homework, okay? You've got to read the comic books, you've got to read the novels, you've got to watch the animated TV series, you've got to watch the trailers, you've got to listen to the podcast, you've got to watch Halo Nightfall, and if you don't, well, you're not going to understand jack shit because you're not a true Halo fan and you don't fucking do your homework. Um, but, but then even that doesn't fix it. Like, I knew who Blue Team was because I'm this huge Halo fan who explores the universe, but knowing that almost made it worse because they didn't use Blue Team in the story at all, so I, these characters I love and know about didn't get any time. Uh, it was odd. There is zero explanation in-game for why the characters Kelly, Linda, Fred, Buck, and the Arbiter are relevant again. I frequently found myself asking, when did Kelly, Linda, and Fred rendezvous with the Chief? Where did they come from? Why are they fighting together? What has the Arbiter been up to lately? Who is controlling the Prometheans? How did Buck become a Spartan Four? I love being an ODST. Of course, all of these questions are addressed in the expanded universe, but the trademark of a well-crafted, self-contained Halo story is a limited dependence on its source material. Halo 5's characters are tacked on just because, serving no purpose other than to please fans and satisfy a co-op mechanic. We're very co-op centric. Um, cooperative play has been a big focus for us, and so we built the story and, um, and the campaign and the level design of the world uh, around cooperative play, so it uh, really uh, every leverages for players at all times. And the early conversations were, well, if we make it a squad-based game, we can double down on co-op. Even when people don't have a co-op partner to play with, we're putting the extra Spartans in there. They'll fight with you, they'll revive you if you go down. I need support. Need a hand here. I'm down. I need a hand. Need a hand here. Give me a hand. Pick up that weapon. Copy that, Lock. Someone take that weapon. In route. Check your sight line! Take this, Spartan. Copy. Pick up that weapon. Copy. Pick up this weapon. Roger. Take this weapon. Copy that. Someone take that weapon. The term we always have internally is your team, your team is your weapon. Your team is your weapon may have been one of 343's design pillars, but the only way for a Halo game to do this would be to change Halo's core gameplay which being a main entry in the series and not a spin-off, was not advisable. What results is a designer's no man's land. Spartan Locke and Master Chief's one-button commands aren't able to communicate a sense of team coordination, and suffers from an issue that's plagued mediocre squad-based games. If you need to center your screen on an enemy in order to tell your squad to fire at it, why not just shoot it yourself? Let's talk about creative pillars. The world is your playground is our first pillar. You want to make the mechanics that enable the most cool stories to, to happen. That's where Spartan abilities really came online, where it was like, what about movement? What about the suit? To me, a Spartan is speed, power, agility. This vision, this myth of a Spartan is a superhero. You see Chief coming down out of orbit, hitting the ground and you know doing all of that stuff. We want to bring that into the gameplay itself. What might end up being on the most sort of overarching ability is this thruster pack ability. Little retro rockets built into your Spartan armor. Can give you a speed boost while you're running, but you can use it in midair. Jump up in the air and I turn my stabilizers on, these jets kick in. You can go back, forward, all directions. We're not really limiting these things.
common sentiment in Halo 5 is that fighting AI isn't quite as much fun as it used to be. In previous games, their AI were programmed with the knowledge that the player wasn't able to clamber places randomly at any time. They weren't able to randomly have a burst of speed by sprinting at any given time. Because the player was such a consistent target, enemy projectiles were slow moving which allowed the player to rely less on cover because if you were skilled enough you could easily clear a room on legendary by just dodging everything in this complex three-dimensional bullet hell. Halo 5 however needs to compensate for the level of unpredictability that comes with the player freedom. You find that Halo 5 has a lot more enemies armed with homing weapons and various insta-kill nonsense that made Halo 2's Jackal Sniper so infuriating. Are there at least a bunch of new enemy types then, right? Nah. The game becomes kind of rather stale and repetitive towards the end, especially one boss battle in particular. Just wait until you fight the Warden Eternal, a boss who is recycled not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, like five, like fucking seven times! How do you have one boss for the whole game and recycle it seven times? It's not even an intricate boss, you just shoot him until he dies. And the last time you have to fight three of him. Even better, that last boss, after you beat him, stairs kind of materialize out of nowhere and this can kill you and set you back to the last checkpoint before you killed him. What? Is that it? What killed me? Are you kidding me? Warden could have been as unique and engaging as those from Metal Gear Solid, Doom, or Dark Souls, and it'd still make you sick to your stomach by the fifth encounter. It's a desperate plea to extend the game's runtime, and is an indefensible inclusion. It was like obvious and confirmed later to be true that the game was supposed to have another level to finish the yeah. game, and it just cuts off and stops abruptly. Is there a certain mission or something that you guys are especially proud of, or an introduction of a new character that you think, you know, you should really, you should really play through to this moment, or, or see how this unfolds, or this is the beginning of something else? Uh, the very last scene is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part about Halo 5 Guardians is without a doubt Cortana's unanticipated, unwanted, and unnecessary return. If anything, Halo 5 was supposed to be about the Chief learning to cope with her loss and gaining independent skills, while also being hunted down by Spartan Locke for his unauthorized descent from the UNSC. Halo 4's ending could have been further solidified and lent meaning by Chief's realization that Cortana would indeed be gone forever, and that he would need to move on without her. But this isn't the direction the studio took the game in. Cortana's the villain. You find her on this, uh, on this Forerunner planet, and you're like, you were rampant, like you were dying. This was like AI death. She's like, oh, I found this place and Fixed it scared it. me. And you're like, I'm good. How many times has this AI gone mad story been told in science fiction media? This man versus machine conflict isn't anything new or fresh. Oh, uh, yes, giant Cortana. Giant wow. Cortana. There was an alternate version of the story where when he rediscovered Cortana, she'd like gone berserk with power and wanted to take over Halo in the universe. What happened to that story? It was too good. <laughs> we had to use this one instead. Let's not go I don't believe that. Go the very last scene is pretty good. In recent news, the narrative director of Halo Actor for Three Industries position has been opened up. Brian Reed is no longer the narrative director for Halo, and it seems that he's been let go from the company entirely. Let's start with multiplayer. We're gonna start with the absolute best thing about Halo 5, the multiplayer. There are lots of opportunities to do cool, satisfying things, lots of little tricks. You can actually now go into an ADS aim down the sight animation on all of the weapons. You can slide into cover more quickly. Uh, you can slide into a kill with a shotgun. Really, the problem with Halo 5 isn't that the experience it offers is individually poor. It's just that for a lot of fans, not all, it doesn't offer an experience that feels like Halo. It wasn't trying to be Titanfall. It wasn't trying to be Call of Duty. It wasn't trying to be any modern shooter. It doesn't play like Halo. It isn't designed like Halo. For many, it just isn't Halo. Everything from the gameplay mechanics to even the art style. 343 do nothing but change Halo. Change, 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 change. But what are those changes? And are they worthy of additions to the game, or do we need the classic Halo field back?
My name is Quindalo, and I'm the multiplayer designer at 343 Industries. You guys actually have esports players playing your game, giving you feedback. How has that helped in the design process? So our pro team back at 343, they kind of belong to the multiplayer team. And we say, okay, this is for the balance play testing today. We're going to play this mode, this map, go all out on it. And then the very next day, we have a report sent to us from the pro team, what they like, what they dislike, what they, you know, what kind of worries them, what they love, just to see like from a holistic approach, how does the game look and feel and actually play at that type of skill level. Do you feel like 343 is really listening and using your feedback to make a positive change in Halo? Like a half and half type thing, I would say. I think that sometimes they, they take our feedback and they either twist it or they just don't listen at all. Simply put, just no. Uh, but an example that I have, we were in a call and we were going over like the maps of like what worked, what didn't. And one of the maps that was brought up, everyone, like it was almost unanimous. The pros were just like, no, that's good. Like Overshield's in a good spot. Noob combo's in a good spot. Like, I think that's probably the map we shouldn't touch. And so it was like, well, something's going to change. So what is it? And we were like, uh... No, no, nothing. Like, not ch don't change anything. We just said it was good, and like they ended up changing stuff. For two years now, we've been telling them what direction this needs to be going in. We've been telling them what needs to be done, but it's being ripped away from us. In an article on GameSpot.com, Kevin Franklin, who was a design director at 343 at the time of this post, claimed that 343 wanted Halo 5 to be an eSport. 343 claims to have engaged with members of the Halo Pro player community early, as well as used the expertise of the ex-pro Halo players on our own development team, integrating them both into our design process. Now, one of the biggest issues with Halo 5's competitive scene were the settings. You know, Raider's never been there, and it's a reward. Like, you're rewarding every single player in the game, and you give me something like a shotgun instead of me having to check like the four different corners that someone could come in and flank me from i just have to sit there and crouch with a shotgun then as soon as he turns that corner is pop just because i know he's there because a the little dot on my screen is telling me that i should have to have at least some awareness or some type of skill to be able to pull something like that off and like know where he's going to come from i should be able, able to have to check my corners all the time instead of just having something that tells me where an enemy is coming from like right now our biggest problems are automatics power weapons and radar. Halo professionals were subjected to playing with fully automatic weapons, radars, and sprint. There were several attempts by professional Halo players to have these features removed from competitive play. Even Neighbor, an ex-pro who was employed by 343 at the time of this post, claimed that Halo 5 maps played just fine without sprint. Later that year, Neighbor announced that he was leaving 343 via Twitter and closed out his tweet with hashtag classic Halo fan. Despite the effort from many of Halo's current and former pros, Sprint and Radar were never removed from competitive play. Outside of Neighbor, several of the original pro team hires have since left 343 Industries. But the sheer power of these techniques kind of changed the rules of Halo. A game that was traditionally about holding a setup and controlling high ground positions on a map became more about coordinated rushdown strategies. And honestly, I enjoyed it for what it was. If you've seen my videos, you would know that Sprint is just the tip of the iceberg. Halo 5's combat system is insanely deep, but they went so far with it and they gave so much power to the player that it does become harder to argue whether or not what we're playing is still Halo or some other crazy sci-fi shooter. Welcome to the Halo World Championship Tour. Tonight, we find out who is the best squad on this continent. Infused on the back foot. Yeah, you heard so much communication from Infused saying, look, I need help here, I need help over there, and they're all just saying to each other, I can't help you, I'm in my own fight. They were all spread out a little bit there, and then they noticed the first camouflage goes to Vex, and finally, Vex have taken so much control, and they are just 12 points away from winning this game. Infused, they really need to speed this one back up. Yeah, and it looks like we may... I have a problem, Dan, unfortunately, because that was a hell of a game, but, you know, let's give it up for both of those teams in that game anyway, because that was a hell of a back and forth. And Looks like it was gonna be a Quadios grab to make sure. Yeah, Quadios did grab it right at 35. He got killed immediately by Fragger to force the burn. So lots of pressure up top mid, neither team wanting to give away a free camo. Enemies return their flag. Well, it's just taking the light rifle, taking things slowly now. SLG comes darting in as I think we've had a disconnect once again. So it is a currently a 1-0 lead. Holding this one right now, looking for some spawns over by the other side. 
of camo, but they are going to be around blue base. And you see a couple players making a move over here, trying to spot anyone where that player went. Nobody knows. Yeah, I don't. Oh, and it looks like, okay, that's what happened there. So, of course, we're going to get that one sorted out. It's going to be a little bit scared, but who did he end up dropping that sniper for? There it is, snipe down. Ready to continue what he is about to what? do here. So he is going to be peeking. Uh, snipe down is just sort of like, what is going on here? Um, that was I have never seen that before. Odd. Very unfortunate for them that they did not have that exact time on the camo. The opponent sneaks away with it. Yeah, again, that's just trust in your coach. If the coach has said that certain time, then you're, of course, just going to believe it and you are going to dive straight onto it as Cristola is uh, stood still there. Maybe he was having a chat with the coach just there, but it looks like we are going to be redoing this game. It's 73 to 31. We'll wait to hear from the station referee on exactly what the call is. Based on what we're seeing on screen, though, pretty sure this will go ahead and the uh, match will be ended. And you said you wanted to hear a listening bra. So we're going to jump into a Fable listening and see how they communicate. Two pop and two pop and two. Guys, watch us one, guys. Watch us one, watch us one. I'm doing well, but there's a guy. Okay, is it going to push? Come on, quit. Fuck. Yeah, quick kill. So just play on, play on, right? I don't know. Nice. Play on, play on. And players just playing on, but it looks like there was another error there. 27 to 16, as far as I'm aware from that point, but there might have been a couple kills had when one player had disconnected. But I think it's going to be a roughly about a 10 kill lead. Yeah. And of course, apologies for all viewers and everyone involved. Of course, it is very frustrating uh, with whatever is happening uh, with these games. So our apologies, of course, from us on the desk. It's equally as frustrating as I'm sure it is for the players. But uh, regardless of that, that was actually a really nicely played uh, from this game, from Facebook, because I was thinking Beck would have come into that one for they have a tent outside for people to, to have the overflow. There's only three rows of spectators. You're treating it like it's a relegation match. Look, that's the Halo tournament right there. That's it right there. <laughs> it's incredible to me that this that they allow this to happen. And I don't I, I blame 343 and Halo. You know, they're the ones that are in charge of this. Today, we're thrilled to unveil the ultimate all-in-one home entertainment system. The one with the power to create experiences that look and feel like nothing else. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Xbox One. We started really big. You know, new platform, you can do anything. It changes your technology, your tools, your pipeline. We didn't want to do things that kind of fit into the mold of existing Halo. But it's mostly opportunistic. It was more, what can we do to continue to evolve the franchise? If you thought split-screen multiplayer was dying, 343 Industries might have just hammered the final nail in the couch co-op coffin. The next game in the Halo series, a series known for its split-screen multiplayer, will not have any split-screen. The decision to remove split-screen support from Halo 5 Guardians was one of the most difficult ones we've ever had to make at a studio. Many of our ambitious goals for Halo 5 would be compromised in a split-screen setting, and the time spent optimizing and addressing split-screen specific issues would take focus from building other parts of the game. Basically what he's saying in layman's terms is this, look, the Xbox One is not powerful enough for us to include split screen, he's just saying it in a more eloquent way. There's no We're way they can include use groundbreaking screen. technology and the power of the cloud to set my imagination free. You know what I got for you? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know how that machine worked. <laughs> there is no split screen multiplayer. At all! One of the core tenets of the Halo franchise now completely ripped out with no warning bar. Now listen, before we get started, I saw some chatter on my Twitter feed about rec packs. Now, yes. now Josh, why don't you explain what rec packs are and how they fit in the game? Sure. So uh, the requisition system is a brand new reward system in Halo 5 Guardians. Basically, it's kind of a leveling system where you're constantly earning stuff uh, to unlock things like weapons and, uh, and some cosmetic stuff that you can use in other parts of the game. The rec system is essentially your standard loot box system, but the rewards you get have a direct and unbalanced impact, like being able to call in a tank. And now, as a normal person, you'd think, wow, that sounds ridiculous. I can't believe you can pay your way to victory. And that's what I thought. And this is how 343 addressed that in their trailer. Rec is short for requisitions, and it's how players are rewarded in Halo 5 multiplayer. You have single-use cards. These are for your vehicles and power weapons, like this magnificent, perfectly crafted death delivery device. 
Uh, wait, won't wreck packs with special weapons break the exquisitely refined balance of arena multiplayer? Secure your noise hole, soldier. Grown-ups are talking. Shut the fuck up, the grown-ups are talking. If you don't like the system, you're not a grown-up. Hello everybody, Max Scoville here for IGN News. While gamers will be able to purchase wreck packs with actual money in Halo 5 Guardians, developers 343 Industries have systems in place to prevent the game's Warzone mode from becoming a pay-to-win experience. In Q&A on Halo Waypoint, 343 Studio Head Josh Holmes addressed such concerns for the community, confirming that the deployment of rec items is limited by the rec level and energy systems that govern the Warzone experience. Only by accomplishing tasks during the match will players be able to level up and in turn get more energy to deploy recs. Hey guys, Icebuffle here bringing you this bonus gameplay video. I set myself a challenge of only using my loadout weapons and the Prophet's Bane power weapon for a full Warzone match. I ended up going 60 to 3 with one inconceivable medal which is a 35 kill streak. This was actually really fun to do and the gameplay you're about to watch was actually my first attempt at doing it. So I think that I could even get a better gameplay if I gave myself some more time to try. Developers 343 Industries have systems in place to prevent the game's Warzone mode from becoming a pay-to-win experience. Don't make a girl a promise you can't keep. Along with the gameplay altering components, the rec system also features cosmetic unlocks. This is a slightly more accepted practice. A lot of games have this and it's tolerated because it doesn't affect gameplay. It's just cosmetic. How many times have you heard someone say that? But this is also bad. And yes, it does make your game worse. It makes armor customization worse. Halo 5's microtransaction based rec packs represent the reward structure of the game. When your primary reward structure is occupied by an RNG system featuring microtransactions, that means a potentially better system isn't being used. Instead of Vidmaster challenges, you have a rec pack for $2.99. Instead of the chase to get Hayabusa that had the player doing a list of challenges, one of which required you getting all achievements, a show of skill, you have a rec pack for $2.99. Instead of an actual progression system that doesn't have you gambling either your free time or your money, you have a rec pack for $2.99. And 99 cents. Hi, I'm Josh Menke. Thanks for coming and welcome to my talk on matchmaking for engagement. So let's get into the talk. This talk's not going to go in depth on skill systems, but it is worth reviewing them to understand how they work into matchmaking. So we have a player, but we want to know how good that player is. So we put a number on them. That number should represent their skill. We use the skill to compare players to other players. We can then figure out the difference in their skill from each other. We also want to take this same concept to the team level. And one way is just to take the average of each team. And I call this the team skill gap. In Halo 5, each player had an invisible rank tied to their account, which is commonly referred to as quote unquote hidden MMR. Basically, the more you won, the higher your hidden MMR generally was. Hidden MMR punished players with the best win percentages by pairing them up with less than adequate teammates against legitimate competition. Not only was that a terrible idea, but it affected your ability to find matchmaking games. For example, if you had a high win percentage in, say, Warzone, your hidden MMR would be so high that you quite literally would not be able to find games in anything. Ranked, social, you name it. On this video, I really want to prove a point and to show everyone how awful this hidden MMR system in Halo 5 really can be. So basically, last Sunday, I decided to play some arena, both social and ranked playlists with some friends, and unsurprisingly, after nearly 50 minutes of searching, we couldn't find a game in virtually all of the playlists while we were on Expanded. We even had some friends searching at the same time, and they could find games in all those playlists. And obviously, you guys don't have to watch the whole video, but leaving some likes, comments, and shares of this video would mean a lot to me because, you know, it'd bring awareness to this, and 
maybe I'll be able to play some Halo in the future. That would be awesome, guys. I'd, I'd love to be able to play some Arena. So the Warzone people I contacted, uh, they said to me like, we can't find any games at all. So we're forced to use brand new accounts and we just destroy the kids all over again. So you're not, they're not really solving anything by implementing this new system because it's just going to force the people who can't find games to make new accounts and then they're going to match those newer players anyway and they're just going to drive them out of the game anyway. All you've done is you've created a huge smurfing problem in an effort to try to combat newer players being destroyed when they first come onto the game. Something that 343 Industries love to point out is that Halo 5 would launch with 21 multiplayer maps, and that 18 more maps would be added for free post-launch. But this was yet another case of over-promising and under-delivering, because many of these 21 maps were either built in the Forge mode, such as all the 5 breakout maps, or maps that had a few parts of them blocked off to make it smaller, like all the Warzone map variants. Even though these two maps are exactly the same, a few spawn points aside, they do count towards the 21 map total. One of the most common criticisms of Halo 5 is that it didn't launch with enough content. How many game modes were missing at launch? Where's team objective? Where's doubles? Where's snipers? And wait, why are there only three arena modes? Halo 5's not going to ship with big team battle mode. What? Big team battle, a component of Halo that was literally present from the beginning, wasn't available at launch. To this day, it is only available with Forge maps and absolutely no developer made maps at all. Even the DLC maps were mostly just Forge made maps, and those that weren't were often map remixes, which is a thing where developers simply take an existing map, move some rooms and corridors around, give it a new paint job, and call it a new map. This is might be a terrible question, but how much would it be, like, could we even change it from being Covenant to something no. else? No. Okay. Big change to the center. That's like our, all of our effort will mostly be spent there. And then we'll kind of like seal off some rooms, maybe change some ramps around. Is this, is this good with you guys? Do you guys are all, are all good with that idea? You're okay with this? Is that the idea that we could go with? Yeah. So everyone agrees. A team will be finishing the, the, the original map as well. So we're going to have to be finishing two maps in parallel. They're gonna hate us. You know that, right? Over the game's lifespan, if we do not count the map remixes or the Forge maps, 343 only released six new original maps as DLC, with three of them being Warzone maps, and one of them being a remake of a Halo 4 map. Of course, it isn't fair to outright not count the numerous map remixes, but why have Forge maps? Why not make maps like High Ground and Zanzibar? with distinct layouts, offering more varied multiplayer experience. You'd say that maybe this is because 343 wanted these maps to also be good for competitive play. But it is a well-known fact that most pros did not like any of the DLC maps added post-launch. They have not released a single competitive esport worthy map since the game has launched. A lot of these maps just feel like they fall in a designer's no man's land, taking parts from existing maps, but not really making any of them stand out enough to offer anything new. It almost feels like 343 had two different layout ideas for every map, and instead of carefully thinking about what would work best, they decided to just have both. Just, you know what? Let's have both and cut split screen from Halo 5. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, we did it! Halo 5, I think, was about not getting too comfortable with knowing we could make a Halo game. You can do it once. You can, you can do that crazy Halo 4 thing once, but you don't want to repeat that. You want to get better and better at making a Halo game. Hines with the sniper. He's going to pull what? it out and he'll get sniped. That went through the wall. I feel like we've taken 15 or 20 huge risks. I think we'll have done a good job if people are shocked at the end of the game and surprised by the direction that that took. I know we have a disagreement. Fire Team Osiris, the light is green. The launch of Halo 5 really is the beginning of the next step in our journey as we continue to support that game and then dream about whatever comes next. Now we have a team that's going to lead Halo going forward. <laughs> <laughs> and now back to work. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Okay, welcome back to our live stream studio. I am happy to be joined today by Bonnie Ross, head of 343 Industries. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. Well, we have a lot to talk about today, so I'm very happy to have you here. I heard from a lot of folks that they just wanted to know what was going on with the Master Chief Collection. Yeah. It's been tough because there just hasn't been any information to share, but I think today we're going to change that. We are, and I would just say that we have been looking at when the right opportunity is to upgrade MCC. And when we do it to get the maximum benefit, we do feel that we want to move it to the latest platform updates so we can take advantage of all the great stuff that the Xbox platform team has done. Sort of with the upcoming release of Xbox One X, it just presented a, a new opportunity that a new console, along with all the platform updates that, that you've mentioned, kind of now makes uh, an MCC kind of revisit a lot less risky and a lot more viable in terms of what we want to do and what we actually can do. So probably sometime next spring, you'll start to see the latest builds of MCC and I hope you guys will help us out and give us some perspective on what's going on. Awesome, well we'll of course have a lot more information and all the details as we get a little closer and those plans get big, but great news for MCC fans to look forward to uh, early next year. Um, and we're talking wait has been so long and we know what this means to fans so it's important that we bring it to PC in the right way. We're going to be very very deliberate and intentional to make sure that it's going to get all the treatments that it, that it offers which includes gorgeous 4K HDR uh, visuals, 60 frames per second gameplay. So that's going to come to Xbox One and to PC. Um, and we're just really excited to now have basically six full Halo experiences under the MCC banner. Halo just came out on the PC and it came out with a ton of game breaking bugs but the biggest one being that if you look at the floor and another person is looking at the floor anywhere in the map it'll start hitting them. See obviously I didn't hit anybody but I killed that guy right there. Now I'm just getting kills just by sitting here shooting at the floor. There we go. Double, triple. Double kill, triple kill. Game over. New meta. You know, new meta. Oh, and apparently this works with grenades too. So just like look down, throw some nades, and they're gonna appear right under your teammates. I'm launching you, throw like Oh launch. shit! I got two. <laughs> I got three. <laughs> My first rocket disappeared and it killed someone. I'm actually weird. I'm, I'm actually weirded out by this. Betrayal. Okay, you see that? Bro. I got kicked from the game. Why is this Spartan, uh... Is it black? Is, is the fucking map black for you? No, but the Spartan is. My, my game crashed. Wait, everyone's walking into walls and... Every... Okay, now I'm, I'm in a... I'm in a 2v1... Okay, it's a 2v1 on Valhalla. Vehicles now quite literally drive themselves. Oh, I see it. I see it. It's happening. <laughs> hey, there goes the chopper. Go over, <laughs> Sean. We're going to be very, very deliberate and intentional. Oh, this guy's got rockets. Are they going to be blanks? They're going to be blanks. He's stuck. What's he going to do? He's going for the melees. He's going for the grenades. The grenades are blank. He's in trouble. Glockness, he's going for the reload. He's getting blanks again. It's uh, it's coming down to the wire. He's got the pistol out. Hey. I don't know what happened to ready when it's ready, but clearly that philosophy doesn't mean anything. Oh, wow. <laughs> just a little bit farther. No, yeah, she's going this way. I think I might want to go over there. Dude, I'm just dying. It's so fucking retarded. The original Halo 2 multiplayer, exactly as it shipped 10 years ago. Now running it all the way in now on his own L1, bringing it, he has reached the snipe. And he might just go in right now, waiting for his shields to recharge. He's going for the cap here. I think he's going to get it, folks. Yes, indeed. And they win the game 3-1. to one. Aspire Esports will take Nero's CTF. Yeah, that was such a fast-paced game from Aspire. And that's what I was talking about. When Fantasy doesn't have the snipe and straight sick does, like, he's always going to be aggressive. He's always going to be playing towards that objective. Since the release of the Master Chief Collection, I noticed that the shot registration in Halo 3 on MCC was fucking awful and did not feel anything like the original game on the Xbox 360. Here are a couple examples of my bullets not registering in MCC. Like right here, boom. 
He's out in the open, I shoot him, blood comes out, doesn't even get hurt. Like, here's another one. Kid standing still, boom, bloodshot. Look at this, boom, bloodshot. Riders an opportunity to respond to those one-shot callouts and actually pick off kills. What I really love about Halo 3, and I don't know why, neighbor, none of those shots seem to be registering for these big flag caps. Yeah, I mean, you don't have the, whoa. <laughs> oh, you see the head shake there, Penguin. Not too happy about that one. Missing clinical work. And, and, and those oh. sneaky plays that would oftentimes... Oh, man. I love seeing a good old-fashioned sniper battle like that, right? Where it's not one that's like all straight to the head. It's just like... That's what it's all about. Yeah, little, exactly. A little dance through the smoke. And these narrows have, matches have started off so close. And all it takes is someone sitting like this in the pocket to run away with the lead. Now they're up by five. Is the early score. Trippy just watching his L1. Hits a shot onto Frosty. Nice job there. Goes for the no-scope on Eco. Misses a couple. Oh, that's unfortunate. You got Frosty with that snipe. Looking for angles. Mm. Man, look at that L2 it? angle. Could have sworn I saw a little blood there. I don't know. He's going to have the sniper. He's also going to have his teammates there. Body shot. He's going to spark the shields off. Losing two of his teammates, though. And looking at the perspectives of Lux here, it is going to be Gabriel that goes in and grabs the overshield. A breath of fresh air here for Lux Gaming. We've not been able to get the power I haven't ball. noticed many people talking about this issue, nor have I seen any videos regarding this. So me and my friend decided to hop into a custom game on the pit to test out how bad the shot registration actually is. So right here on the pit, you know, me and my friend, like I said, we were taking turns shooting each other back and forth. And not one time did the host kill the player who didn't have host. It never happened. Look at this shot right here. Where do my bullets go? And this isn't just one clip, like one time this happened. This happens to me all the time. And it was so easy to replicate it. All I had to do was go into a custom game. We, we were in there for a couple minutes and boom, I did that. It's not hard to replicate that at all. been brought to my attention that the other day during one of Ace's streams he was playing with Dursky and both him and Dursky had had a little something to say about one of my videos. The video they were talking about was my hit detection video. Now right now I'm going to play the video so that you guys can see what Ace and Dursky had to say about my video. So let's get right into it. Are you watching the blackout clip? MCC. Right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom. Boom. The <laughs> <laughs> first he's yeah, hugging the wall. I know. <laughs> not near a wall. You're in the wall. Boom. 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 I don't know. It's just, that's how they are. Boom. You could kind of hear Ace and Dursky giggling in the background and talking shit. And it's pretty fucked up because they're both public figures. Ace is a huge Halo pro and has been for many years. And Dursky used to be a Halo pro and he's currently employed by 343 Industries. This is why people don't like Halo 3. <laughs> it's because they're trash. I fully understand that companies talk shit about clients and customers all the time. But Dursky, bro, you're on a live stream with hundreds of viewers and you're laughing at a guy who's trying to make a difference. The point I was trying to make in this video about the blood shots was that you'll have players standing out in the open like this guy on the pit and I'm getting a blood shot on him. 17,000 really views. I know. I had people coming to me like, yeah, can you watch this video and this guy's shot registration shit? I was like, but yeah, sure, let me see it. For another time. And I just started laughing literally, Xbox, like, out loud at work. Just laughing. Was somebody at work showed you this? Yeah, somebody was like, yeah, you that should look into the Halo 3 shot registration. I was like, uh, when was that? Like, in, like, uh, February. So let me get this right. Somebody at work showed you my video and told you that you should look into the Halo 3 hit detection on MCC and you just laughed it off. You just laughed it off as if it's not a real fucking issue. One of the things that we're going to try and do is have a much more open dialogue with the community. One word for you. 343 have created new interfaces and new menus for everything from matchmaking to customizing your Spartan. And now you may be asking something along the lines of, okay, how badly can you really fuck up a menu though? What actually irritates me is the game no longer has a voting system. In the original Halo Reach matchmaking, players were able to vote on the map that they would prefer to play. While you were never guaranteed to get the map that you voted for, it's a good system to have in place. 343 have done away with this system to replace it with nothing. Now there's no voting and the map selection is entirely random. The other annoying part is you don't even see what game mode you're playing before the game starts. The Halo channel still doesn't work. Yep. 
it doesn't work. Look, here I have Forest selected as the color for my armor, but the last color I moused over was Cyan, and the game is still showing me what my Spartan would look like with Cyan highlights on her armor, even though I've moused away from that now. This is really inconvenient. Let's say I want to see what my Spartan looks like with white highlights and uh, teal armor. No, no, that's not... no. <laughs> white highlights? No. Unlocked avatars and nameplates don't tell you what you did to unlock them. The leaderboards load way faster, but it bugs out whenever you try to change the filters. I want to see what my logo looks like with a triangle background. And to do that, I'm going to click the triangle and then slowly guide my cursor through this tiny ca Fuck! You get to see the server ping in different countries, which would be helpful if the game wasn't region locked. Let's say I want to change my Spartan's helmet. Mousing over all of the different helmets doesn't actually give you a preview of that helmet until you click on the folder to open up and see all of the different variants of that helmet. Okay, so let's say you've actually entered a folder to check what that folder actually contains. Well, when you exit that folder, it takes you back to the top of the list. So let's say you want to find one specific helmet that's right at the bottom of the list. You have to actually click each folder, then go, oh, no, nope, it's not this one. Then try to remember your spot and, oh, hang on, which one was it I was looking at? And really, I mean, we're still working at it, right? I mean, really nailing that, that interface, that UI has been a massive task, but, um, it was funny when we started talking about it at a conceptual level, it was one thing. And as we started showing it to people, and people really saw how powerful a tool we were putting in the hands of the player with that interface, just everything just clicked. Halo Infinite multiplayer will be free to play. We want to make sure we hear our players, make sure the game is ready for launch. We're going to give you great ways to customize your Spartan. Millions of customization combinations for Spartans on the battlefield. When you're making a competitive game and it's on PC, you need anti-cheat. Nothing makes me lose interest in a game faster than realizing just how little there is to do in it. There's no progression system, there's a ton of missing content and features, the main menu is just a mess, the big team battle mode hasn't worked in over a month, the desync issue has gotten completely out of control, there's a big cheating problem because of the lack of any or at least a good anti-cheat. An experience that's going to evolve month to month, season to season, year after year.